Sweeney. Two years ago, uh, I saw an interview with a Catholic priest, and uh, that's before I took the to think so. And he was contrasting Catholic and evangelical approaches to the Christian life. And he said, rightly, I think, that Catholics are pretty good at introducing people to the church, but not good at introducing people to Jesus. But then he said evangelicals are not really good at the importance of the church, but are very good at introducing people to Jesus. And I think he was right. Well, I hope he's right. The core passion, core purpose of the church is to introduce people to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not hard to invite people to the church, it's not hard to go to church, it's not it's hard to sit in church, but it is a different thing altogether that comes around the Lord Jesus Christ. Sitting in the church is easy, isn't it? Surrendering our lives to Christ, being born again in the Spirit, is quite a nice thing in a different order. I'm speaking today on the subject, the experience that counts, and saying that being born again is the experience that counts. Being born again is the basic, foundational, indispensable experience and reality of the Christian life. No one is a Christian without being born again. No one is a heaven unless they are born again. No one qualifies for baptism unless they are born again. Being born again is the experience that counts more than any other experience, whether that experience be some sort of mystical spiritual experience or emotion or physical or relation, whatever. A big word for being born again is regeneration. The key word in the New Testament is palingenasia. How about that for a sad word? Anybody type in This carrot for a speech of it. Pizza customer, John Cleese. Pizza shopkeeper, Michael Palin. Palingenasia. No? Genasia, or the G G N word in English referred to congenital generation. Yeah. Being born again. Palingenasia means life again, restoration, a fresh start, being born again. When explaining to his disciples the restoration of all things at the end of time in Matthew 19, Jesus uses the word. In a cosmic sense, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, rebirth, restoration of all things, cosmically in heaven and earth, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. So the word can even refer to a cosmic restoration and renewal of all things. But it's primarily me, and I want this morning to talk about a personal, individual rebirth that you and I must pursue, the individual rebirth. That is the experience that counts in our lives because without it, we do not enter the kingdom of God. Even up on this. Jesus speaks about the birth from above, and the most famous of all passages, as you know, is the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, the Pharisee in John 3. But curiously, the word Palingenasia is not used. In fact, two words used. Genestate in Asia meaning born, and also anathem meaning from above. Jesus says being born from above, that is being born from heaven, being born from God. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see or enter or experience the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. And then in verse 7, to express it, you must not be surprised. You must not be surprised at my saying you must be born from above. And this the Pharisee being righteous, God fearing Pharisee. And Nicodemus was surprised because he misunderstood it at first time. In this misunderstanding, it is this misunderstanding that makes the word born from above to mean the same as being born again or a second time. 
Well, Nicodemus accepted in verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? In other words, myself. Surely you cannot enter a second time, not a first time, a second time, again, a second time, in his mother's womb to be born. So Nicodemus clearly understands Jesus' words as a second birth, a rebirth, being born again. But he misunderstands it. And in his explanation, Jesus makes a radical distinction between born, being born of flesh and being born of the spirit. In verse 6, he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. It is clear that there is a radical distinction between human conception and motherly birth and spiritual birth by the Holy Spirit. So with all ecclesiastical due respect, the Archbishop I once sat right in front of and said, this baby has been a Christian since conception, as if that type of birth was, I believe, profoundly wrong. Scripture knows nothing of what I call interuterine regeneration. But even if it did, how did the Archbishop know it was true in this case? But there is one similarity between birth by mothers and the Holy Spirit. In neither of them do we birth our souls. In neither of them can we create or generate our own life. Our mothers and fathers gave us spiritual life as a gift. It has nothing to do with us. And God gives us spiritual life through his Holy Spirit. It is all of God. We add nothing to it because we cannot spiritually generate ourselves. It is wholly of God. As the conversation continues, Jesus tries to clarify the matter for Nicodemus. Jesus says, I'm speaking of heavenly things, not earthly things, and he can be trusted when he speaks about heavenly things because he came down from heaven so he knows what he is talking about. Who knows what they're talking about if they're talking about Century Point? Someone who lives in Century Point or someone who lives in Darwin and has never been there? Jesus came down from heaven, but he's the expert and knows what he's talking about. And in the final analysis, in verse 15, what he is talking about is eternal life. So the experience that counts for you and for me is being born again, regenerated, born from above, born from God the Holy Spirit. It is God renewing our life, giving you spiritual life so that you will no longer spiritually be doing your sin, but have eternal life. And there are two statements in the Apostles that bear this out which I want to read from Peter, from Paul, and from Peter. The first one is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. It's from Paul. And I will read just the beginning of verse. One and then verse 5. So it's a long paragraph, and all the stuff in between just explains the first part. So I'll read the first part and the last part. He says, As for you, he writes in Ephesians, as for you, what he's right as well, isn't it, right? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. There you go. As for you, you were dead. In your transgressions and sins, the word of God says to us when we read it. And then at the end, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. You were dead, the merciful God made us alive. We did not make ourselves alive. You see, our sins killed us, God raised us, gave us new life. It's God's word. Secondly, Peter, 1 Peter 1 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, that's what Paul, isn't it? In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope 
to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has given us new birth into a living hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The word used for new birth is anachronosis. Anachronosis theology. There is never any suggestion that we regenerate ourselves. It is always, everywhere, without exception, God's word. This means that regeneration and born again is the first element in the Christian life. It is when a person comes spiritually alive for the first time. Until a person is spiritually born and made alive, they are spiritually dead. No matter who they are, no matter how nice they are, how good they are. And you see, the mission of the church with the gospel is not about making people nice, it's about making people new, new people. And what we do to facilitate that, like a midwife, is to proclaim the gospel of Christ and his salvation and the gift of eternal life. So it is easy, isn't it, to see why being born again is the experience that counts. Without it, there is no Christian life. There is no forgiveness of sin. There is no eternal life. There is no experience of God. There is, in fact, no spiritual life at all. Without it, we are spiritually dead. Nice, perhaps, kind and friendly, things like that, yes, perhaps, but nonetheless, spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins and facing, as St. Paul so solemnly says, the wrath of God, which we pray that they would avoid. But how does regeneration come about? For the fall of God, how does it come about? Jesus says in John 3, verse 5, that the wind blows the word for wind and spirit of the sign of the word that we do know. Jesus likens the word of the Holy Spirit to the wind. Mysterious, uncertain, invisible, and unpredictable. And I think we're going to unpack it like this. Rebirth is a mystery, but a certain mystery in our lives. Second, it is invisible because it's holy inward. And third, we do not know who will be born again. A first is mysterious, but certain. Those who are born again. No, they are born again. True. You know you are born again. We know the experience. We have experienced the renewal of our hearts. We are certain about it. We experience inwardly. But it remains something that is beyond all rational explanation to people like Nicodemus, the religious proselytes of Satan, who will always want rational, logical explanations for us. But unfortunately, We'll never be able to get them. Secondly, it's invisible. We don't know that we don't know what we know. But regeneration is extremely and unseen.
Ó, oh, vocês não. Jesus is good, but faith that surrenders itself and receives Christ. Consciously, knowingly, I receive you, Lord, into my heart as Lord and Saviour. And the word receive is important to all who received him. And so the question is obvious. Have you, have we all, personally received Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour and said yes to him? That is true faith. It is personal. It is real. It's a genuine receiving of Jesus into our lives. That's our human element to it. But it's God's work, this fact that we are given spiritual life. Now, there are two misleading falsehoods about regeneration that I just uh, would like to address at this point. The first one is what is called baptismal regeneration. This means that the very act of baptism in and of itself washes away original sin and brings about new birth. It matters not if faith is present. It is clearly no faith if the baby is baptised, and I use that loosely, but it even becomes problematic if the candidate is an adult. Some people, adults, can look at baptism like a magic formula, a magic event, like an abracadabra thing, and the baptism itself brings about regeneration. Baptismal regeneration means that the act of baptism itself and not the faith that accompanies baptism is the human element in regeneration. And this view is especially held by those who do babies, but it is easily seen to be inadequate, first because baby baptism is foreign to the New Testament, but second, we find millions of baptised people who lead the most godless, evil and sinful lives, don't we? We see them. I have no spiritual life about them at all. Some do, but millions don't. And I'm sure we all have friends, strong, vital, vigorous Christian friends who are baptised as babies. But that doesn't mean the act of baptism made them Christian because there are so many others and more who are also dumb who live ungodly lives. For me, the most celebrated, if I could use that word maybe wrongly, person who demonstrates that baptism in and of itself without faith does not impart new spiritual life is the man who was baptised as a baby, later trained for the Christian priesthood but didn't finish, and then went into politics with the most, one of the most worldwide reputations as a political leader. You know him as uh, Joseph Stalin. Can anyone really believe that he was born again of the Holy Spirit by his infant baptism? Seriously? Where was the life in Christ murdering millions of innocents? I'm quite happy to say if the Soviets repudiated him, we can too. The problem with baptismal regeneration, not only that it's foreign to the New Testament, is it misleads people into believing that their baptism alone is a sure guarantee of their regeneration and eternal life. Of itself, it's not. It's not a magic act. Now, baptism is important in the New Testament. We've had the joy of seeing baptisms in our own church recently. For that, we give thanks to God. But it is the outward testimony of the faith of regeneration. We are thankful to God and praise God for those who confess Christ in baptism. But by itself, 
devoid of believing and receiving Christ as Lord and Saviour, it accounts for nothing. You see, baptism accompanies regeneration but does not bring it about. Baptism accompanies regeneration but does not bring it about. My wedding band accompanied my wedding and my marriage but it did not bring it about. But there's a second false misunderstanding of regeneration. I've read about this particularly more amongst younger people in their teens and 20s. It's what I call mystical whimsy. This is the experience of sitting in a beautiful church, often a cathedral, you know, with lovely music, the sun shining through the stained glass, illuminating the communion table and its glistening bits of lovely shiny metal. There's a sense of well-being and contentment in the heart. There's a type of beautiful feeling that all comes over us. And thinking that that is a true spiritual experience of God that guarantees our eternal future and knowledge of God, and that is regeneration. If the first mistake trusts in church ritual alone, this one trusts in subjective feelings, an ethereal, mystical sense beyond words, that something sort of overcome us. Or even worse, some people can talk about sitting on a beautiful, rocky lookout and seeing the beautiful, lovely sunset. Or worse still, but about people sitting on the beach and seeing beautiful frolicking dolphins and having this beautiful feeling over them. Now, subjective feelings like that are beautiful. You've had them, I've had them. They are nice, aren't they? You sit there, it's just a beautiful feeling. But they are not regenerating and do not bring us to God and impart the new birth. We can enjoy them, sure. But we should never be misled by them into thinking that somehow we are now close or closer to God or born again because of them. That's not the case. This idea of regeneration of God giving fresh life, of giving new life, really builds on the whole Old Testament drift that God is the creator of life. God is the giver of life. Genesis 2 showed us, didn't us, clearly that every aspect of our life is from God. God made man from the dust of the ground. And then it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A bit like giving CPR and resuscitation. That's the image. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man it says man became a living being. The Hebrew word nefesh, meaning soul or person or being. A man only came alive when God breathed life into him. He was made alive, generated, enlivened, animated, enlivened, ensouled only by God's breath. A soul was not added to him like an extra arm. He became a soul, a living being, holy and completely, fully alive, living, breathing, animated, vital alive to himself and God and to others. This was God's creation. This was God's gift. And in Genesis 1 verse 3, God says, let there be light. That shining light is like being born again. For Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, quoting it, for God said, let, the, let light shine out of darkness. This God who said, let light shine out of darkness, Genesis 1, 3, made his light shine in our hearts. You see what Paul is saying? The renewal of the human heart by God is just like the original creation. The same God does both. God created this universe and said, let there be light, and then he shone the light of his gospel into your heart and mine to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It is a new creation. First creation, Genesis, new creation here. God is the giver of life. It is beautifully captured by the introduction of the third article in the Nicene Creed, which says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Who is the giver of life? The Holy Spirit. 
Psalm 104 says about living things, God, when you take away they, their breath, they die and return to the dust. Isn't that an echo of Genesis 2 and 3? But when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. When God withdraws his spirit and breath, living things return to the dust. When God breathes forth and sends his spirit, God creates, God renews, even the whole face of the earth. This emphasis upon life, God giving life and the spirit giving life, is all over the New Testament. Just before Israel entered the promised land, this is what God said through Moses in Deuteronomy 30. Listen to this. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life. For the Lord your God is your life. Can you see how passionate God is for us to live and to live fully? Have you got that? To every person, God says, choose life. We see people choosing death all the time, don't we? They wage war, they kill themselves, they abuse their bodies, they do all sorts of terrible things to their bodies, they take in chemicals and drink and drugs and smoke, do all sorts of things to bring death to themselves. God says, choose life. Choose life. I want you to live. That's what God wants. And the ultimate experience, the experience that counts, is being born again, coming fully alive for the very first time. There is physical life, which is God's gift, of course. There's also spiritual life, which is also God's gift. We all have the first sitting here today. Do we all have a second? God trust it. So this, friends, is the experience that counts. It is the experience of being born again, being made spiritually alive for the very first time. It is the very start of the Christian faith and the Christian life. God wants us to live well. Now choose life. With regeneration, we are born again into a living hope that never fades or spoils. You know, Peter goes on to talk about that living hope kept safe in heaven for you, which never spoils or fades, that we will inherit. Isn't that a comfort that Carol has this morning, Bruce? Born again into a living hope in heaven that never fades or spoils or passes away. What a rich, beautiful promise we all have. <laughs> being made new with the spirit, being regenerated is all God's work in our hearts. Our response is to receive Christ and believe. God says, now choose life. And this is the experience that really counts. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have, in your wonderful kindness, created us, that you breathed into our nostrils and we became living beings. We've become alive in our physical life here and now, our emotional, mental, relational life. All of that is from your wonderful hand. We have received life as a gift this life today tomorrow and we thank you too that you promise new life through your spirit through being born again help us father all of us to know that we have truly received christ that we believe in him and help us to live out our life of regeneration our new life in the power of the spirit and this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.